everyone to UNESCO's World Philosophy Day at the City College of New York. My name is Massimo Pilucci. I'm a professor in the Department of Philosophy at City College. We've been doing this for a number of years, and it's always been fun. We've always had, always had very good, good speakers and entertaining, interesting talks, and I think I'm pretty sure today it's not going to be an exception. Let me tell you a little bit about World Philosophy Day before we get started, and then I'll introduce our keynote speaker. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, has declared each third Thursday in November to be World Philosophy Day. Well, why is that? As Irina Bokova, who is the Director General of UNESCO, put it, uh, faced with the complexity of today's world, philosophical reflection is, above all, a call to humility, to take a step back and engage in reasoned dialogue, to build together the solutions to challenges that are beyond our control. This is the best way to educate enlightened citizens equipped to fight stupidity and prejudice. The greater the difficulties encountered, the greater the need for philosophy to make sense of questions of peace and sustainable development. In establishing World Philosophy Day, UNESCO highlighted the importance of philosophy as a discipline, especially for young people, underlining that philosophy is a discipline that encourages critical and independent thought and is capable of working towards a better understanding of the world and promoting tolerance and peace. Those are lofty ideals. We'll see what comes out of, uh, of uh, today's talk. And therefore, let me introduce you our speaker, who is Peter Adamson. Peter is a professor of philosophy in late antiquity and the Islamic world at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, as well as a professor of ancient medieval philosophy at King's College London. That's a long commute, Peter, but... <laughs> Aside from articles, monographs, and edited books, he is known for hosting the weekly podcast, History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps, which has also been turned into a book series, surpassing 25 million downloads by 2019. The podcast has gone through 350 episodes from pre-Socratic philosophy up to Renaissance philosophy, and also a, a number of special series on Indian philosophy, African and Africana philosophy, and Chinese philosophy. Peter, welcome to City College uh, well, Philosophy Day. Thanks so much. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming and thank you so much Massimo for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, I have a kind of amateurish looking PowerPoints, <laughs> which I will show you now. Um, so uh, hopefully you can all see that. So this is a talk which I'm giving because I suggested to Massimo that I should give a kind of boring talk, the kind I usually give about the history of philosophy. And he said, can't you give something that's more kind of polemical and exciting? So this is very gonna be very polemical and exciting. I should say in, at the outset that in some ways what I'm, what I'm gonna be presenting here is something that I sort of think is true like five out of seven days of the week. So I think there's a lot to be said for what I'm about to say. I can easily imagine objections to what I'm about to say and you will probably think of some too but it's a very different way of thinking about philosophy than most of you probably have. And so I think even if there's something to be said for this different conception that I'm about to present, it'll be worth hearing just so you can sort of think about how it compares to the way you think about philosophy already. And the contentious nature of what I'm about to say is betrayed by my subtitle. So the title is philosophy is the history of philosophy. And the subtitle is five claims of which you will probably reject the first four. And in fact, even the fifth claim is probably one you'll accept, but for different reasons than the one I will give you for believing in it. Okay, so um, the, the basic thought uh, I have here is that we should take this very seriously, the claim in the title, philosophy is the history of philosophy. And as Massimo said, uh, for the past more than 10 years, I've been working on this podcast, which covers the entire history of philosophy, at least that's the idea eventually. And it covers the entire history of philosophy without any gaps, as is the motto of the podcast and book series. So the thought here is that ultimately the ideal version of the project, which I will no doubt never achieve fully, would be to give a fairly detailed introduction to all philosophy by all thinkers who have ever existed in every culture and time. Now, obviously that's not possible, right? But to give you some idea of how detailed it is, I did more than 70 episodes on philosophy in the Islamic world, 
And together with Janard and Ganari, I did more than 60 episodes on philosophy in classical India, and that's only classical India. So we'd probably need another 60, 70 episodes to do the remaining history of philosophy in India. Together with Chike Jeffers, I'm now doing Africana philosophy, and we are on course to cover that topic in 100 episodes or more. So that gives you an idea of how much there is to say about even philosophical topics, which are unknown to most people, even most people who have done a degree in philosophy, in fact, even most professional philosophers, which as you'll see is gonna be quite relevant to my argument. So um, what I want to suggest is that we should have a conception of philosophy that does justice to this massive body of ideas, writings, theories, argumentation, and so on. Um, and against, and, and I want to set against this a different conception of philosophy, which is that you're doing philosophy when you get it right. So there would be a certain set of questions that count as philosophical questions, whatever those are, and I'll come back to that question, like what, uh, the question of what philosophical questions are. But there's some questions that we pose in philosophy, for example, in ethics, epistemology, metaphysics. So things like, do I have free will? Does God exist? What is the right way to live? What's the right way to organize a political community, et cetera? And I think a lot of philosophers think that the point of philosophy is to get the right answers. And that's a very intuitive way of thinking about philosophy, right? So the point of chemistry is to ask questions about chemicals and get the right answers, right? I think philosophy is different because it's not about getting the right answers. It's rather understanding what there is to be said on behalf of certain answers and against certain answers. So my idea here is that you pose a question like, does God exist? Or maybe a more specific question than that, like something like, is free will compatible with determinism, which is a philosophy, philosophical question that was asked in antiquity by the Stoics, Massimo's favorite philosophers, and is still asked by a metaphysician today. And you then explore what, it, what would happen if you said yes, what would happen if you said no? And you find out that there are kind of costs and benefits to both answers. And then you understand the problem, or at least the more you explore, the implications, costs, and benefits, further questions that arise, and so on, that come along with certain answers to certain questions, the more you understand that philosophical problem. And actually, notice that you understand the problem better if you really understand very deeply what there is to be said on both sides of an issue, or maybe there's more than two sides. But let's take a simple case, like the question I just posed, so is free will compatible with determinism? Some people say yes, some people say no, but obviously you're not doing philosophy yet when you just say yes, right? You're doing philosophy when you explain why it would make sense to say yes, why it would be problematic to say no, how to answer certain counter arguments to saying yes, and so on and so forth. Um, and the, the more you understand both sides of the issue, the better philosophical understanding you have of the topic, okay? Notice that this is why people who are writing about philosophy professionally spend so much time thinking about the opposing view and what the person who adopts the opposing view might say to them, anticipating what they might say, trying to undermine possible counter arguments before they even arise, trying to understand the rationale for denying the view they find so compelling and intuitive and so on. So I, mean, I think this is actually something that most philosophers, if not all philosophers would agree with, that part of being a good philosopher is being good at understanding and dealing with the view you disagree with, okay? Now, of course, at the end of all that, you might therefore, to this yes or no question, is free will compatible with determinism? You might say yes, you might say no. In other words, you might kind of vote, right? So having considered this mass of arguments on one side of the question and on the other side of the question, I finally say yes or no. But actually, I think that's not the interesting part. And it's also in a way not the philosophical part, right? That's just the part where you say, here's, here's what I think given everything I've considered about this so far, I vote yes. 
But the voting is not the philosophy part. The philosophy part is where you see what there is to be said in favor of yes and what there is to be said in favor of no. Um, so let me spell this out a little bit more. Um, as I said, when you pose a question um, for, let's take a simple case, does God exist? You see, you might see once you're reflecting on it philosophically, that if I say yes, there might be some reasons not to say yes that I have to deal with. So like the problem of evil, right? So a good all powerful God would not have created a world that has evil in it. This world has evil in it. Therefore, God doesn't exist. So somehow I need to deal with that. Even noticing that problem is not really very philosophical yet. I mean, sort of the beginning of philosophical reflection. The philosophy really gets going once you start thinking of possible solutions, once you start thinking of answers to those solutions, and so on. Um, you might also notice that Give, give an answer to one philosophical question might uh, have a knock-on effect for another philosophical question. So to use the example I was just giving before, suppose, so you might say, well, is causal determinism true or not? So in other words, are all events necessitated by chains of causation that go back into the past, right? So it, it's inevitable that I'm giving this talk right now and you're listening to it, if indeed you are still listening to it, because the history of the world has causally necessitated it to happen, right? Um, so if, if I accept determinism, I might then wonder, oh, I wonder what that means for free will. Does that mean I can't, be, can't believe in free will or not? Uh, so if it means I can't believe in free will, then I'm a libertarian. If it, if it allows that I can still believe in free will, I'm a compatibilist and so on. You don't have to understand this particular issue. Hopefully you get the point. Furthermore, you might, once you start thinking about all these questions and also thinking about how questions lead to other questions, you might start to see that there are some questions that you hadn't thought about before that are philosophical questions. So for example, people didn't think about race as a philosophical issue until fairly recently. In fact, you could argue that the, whole, the idea of race itself is a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, also feminist philosophy is fairly new. I, you could argue that it goes back to Christine Pizan and the Christine de Pizan in the Renaissance, but certainly there's no, there's arguably no feminist philosophy in, let's say, Greek antiquity. Maybe there is actually, like Plato is saying that women can be guardians in the Republic. But the point is that our conception of what the terrain is to be explored in philosophy changes over time, and that's okay, I think. And I take that metaphor that I just used rather literally, or at least I would like to explore the metaphor that it suggests, um, even if it's only a metaphor and not really literal. So I think of philosophy as not being like a building site where you, where each generation of philosophers kind of rises up to another level and can stop thinking about the lower floors because they've gotten higher or better. Philosophy is more like a map where you're exploring a network of ideas, questions, answers, objections, problems, puzzles, etc. And you're seeing how it all links up and you're seeing how certain answers to certain questions face certain problems, imply further questions and so on. So this, and actually um, what you're doing when you're doing philosophy is sort of like exploring this map, probably only a pretty small part of the map at any one time, right? Like just the part that's about, let's say, how causal determinism uh, bears on questions of ethics, right? So that's the only thing you're thinking about. And you might think about that for years and years if you're a professional philosopher. So you're kind of, you know, exploring this tiny little corner of the map that uh, has to do with that issue. Um, but as long as you're sort of figuring out how these things all fit together, you're doing philosophy. I actually have thought after coming up with this metaphor, that it might not be so much like a map as a three-dimensional map, because one thing philosophers do is they think about philosophy, right? So, or even if you think about something like skepticism, which is a question I'll come back to in a minute. Um, so if someone says, well, I'm skeptical that any philosophical um, questions can be answered at all, then essentially what they're doing is, well, they're reflecting on this map and saying, well, all of the answers that are being given in the first order map down on the surface are 
either wrong or not ultimately defensible. So they're kind of making an observation about the map. But of course, that itself is a philosophical claim, right? The claim that philosophical questions are unanswerable is itself philosophical, and it would itself have uh, knock-on effects, right? Objections it has to face, further implications, and so on. So maybe you could think about it as a three-dimensional map, but we don't need to worry about that. I'll stick with the metaphor of a, of a simple map from now on. So what I want to say is that the history of philosophy is far from being only of antiquarian interest. And what people usually think is, well, there's history of philosophy, and then there's the philosophy of now, what we might call contemporary philosophy. And contemporary philosophy is kind of where philosophy has gotten to now. So it's the top floor of this building that we've been building. And we would only need to visit the lower floors of the building for reasons that interest us now that we're living on this floor, right? So um, something that people sometimes say is that history of philosophy is mostly valuable because you might be able to go back and find interesting ideas that could be applied in today's philosophical debates. This is actually when I was in grad school and I was going out on the job market, uh, I was told that that was the right answer to the question, why should we be interested in the history of philosophy? And so I was told, if, if they ask you, why should we be interested in the history of philosophy, say, because it can help us, uh, you know, discover unappreciated answers to the questions we face now, because the analytic philosophers who work on contemporary philosophy will appreciate that answer. So I was actually asked that at, a, at an interview when I was trying to get a job in philosophy, and the interviewer said, yeah, yeah, other than that. <laughs> so I had to think of something else. In fact, I had to tell them what I really thought, which was an early version of what I'm telling you now. Um, I, I, and actually, I, I have more sympathy with a story I just heard the other day, which is that a philosopher who I will not name was asked this question by an analytic philosopher at a job interview and said, well, I would point out to you that you are trying to become part of the history of philosophy and failing <laughs> because in a hundred years, no one will know who you are. Whereas I work on people who are still known after 2000 years or a thousand years or whatever. And I think there's, there's some truth to that. Uh, although I wouldn't recommend saying that in a job interview necessarily. So what I would say is that the history of philosophy, studying the history of philosophy shows us the territory that's already been explored, right? So it shows us all the ideas that have been proposed on all of these questions and Played, played out in real time, what objections were raised, what issues were discovered that related perhaps surprisingly to certain answers that were given to certain questions and so on. Um, of course, historical figures were often way off over in sort of New Zealand, so to speak, maybe some of you may be in New Zealand, but they may have been very far from us on the map. So like, if you imagine that since this is happening in New York, uh, or at least it's, I'm in Munich, but you are in New York, most of the so, But so if we think of contemporary philosophy as New York, maybe medieval philosophy was New Zealand, but they were still doing philosophy, right? They were asking philosophical questions, giving answers to these questions, thinking about what they would entail, thinking about objections and so on, right? So when they asked, you know, well, if there are angels, um, given that matter is what makes it possible for there to be more than one thing of a given kind, and given that angels have no matter, how can there be more than one angel of a certain kind? So that's not a question that any philosopher I know is asking today in the context of contemporary philosophy, but it's something they talked about a lot in the 13th century. And it's a philosophical question, right? So if you imagine an immaterial being um, of a certain kind, what differentiates it from another item of the same kind, right? Perfectly good philosophical question. So that's an area of the map that was very well explored in the 13th century. If you want to know all the moves that can be made in that part of the map, you have to go look at the texts that were written in the 13th century. And notice, by the way, that it would be pretty pointless to go over all that again now, right? So you'd be wasting a lot of time if you just came up with a lot of the same answers to the same question, because you it would, unbeknownst to you, they'd already figured this all out back in the 13th century. For, so, and not only is the history of philosophy an opportunity to see people exploring the map, but in a sense, it just is the map. 
right? It's the map that's been filled in so far. It has blank spaces, as I'll say later, um, because there must be room for more philosophy to be done, right? It's not like we're finished. We haven't completely explored the space that philosophy can explore, but the full version of the philosophical map that humans have thus far achieved is already there waiting for us to look at in the form of the history of philosophy. Okay, that's my idea. Uh, let me give you a couple of analogies for this, which I think might help. So think about philosophy as being like mathematics in that it's an exploration of logical entailments, um, arguments, objections, and so on, um, that just grows and grows and grows the more that people explore it. Um, note, notice also that it, this, is this is perfectly consistent with the idea that there might be more and less interesting places to explore, right? So you can do valid mathematics that mathematicians consider to be boring and that that stuff usually doesn't get published. But on the other hand, what is considered interesting sort of changes, right? So some areas of mathematics that, I, I don't know very much about mathematics, but some areas of mathematics that didn't get a lot of attention for a long time might suddenly start getting attention because they it turns out that they're practically applicable in ways that were underestimated, right? Like graph theory might be an example like that. Um, so I think philosophy is a little bit like that, but it's also a lot like the history of art, right? So art develops, it almost always responds to art of the past so that it has this kind of organic historical evolution. And the different things you can do in, let's say, just, let's just take the case of painting, although it would be true of art more generally, all, every new painting is a new exploration of the possibilities available to you when you're making a painting, right? And it never ends. So people, when Marshall Duchamp hung his urine along the wall, people thought, oh, like that in some sense is the end of art. He's made the last move. But of course he hadn't because people kept making art. And a lot of the art is considered to be very valuable. Philosophy probably also will never end because it's just this ever increasing exploration of the space. Now, a lot of what I said may have sounded skeptical, right? Because you might think, well, if philosophy is only an exploration of what there is to be said on behalf of certain answers to certain questions, then that's consistent with the idea that we'll never know which answers are true. We'll only ever have an increasingly good idea of what, what there is to be said on every side of every question but there's always the possibility of giving more considerations on every side of every question. And I think that's probably right. So I think that philosophical truth or our grasp of philosophical truth is probably always provisional. So when you do vote, what you're voting on is, well, here's what I think given everything I've looked at so far, but it seems to me that you should probably be open to the thought that there might be new considerations over the next hill, so to speak. Um, but I don't think anything I said actually requires that. So you could think, well, oh, I found the part of the map, which is the right part of the map, and I found the right, I found the right answers, and I've shown that everything else is false, right? But I, mean, I think even then I would want to say that it's not like only the true part of philosophy, if you thought you could get it, counts as philosophy, right? Philosophy is all the answers to all the philosophical questions both the wrong answers and the right answers. So whether you think that there are right answers or not, whether you think that right answers can be found or not, philosophy as a whole would still be the whole history of philosophy as it expands into the future. Um, another thing that I would say, and here I would be non-skeptical for sure, is that the very fact that certain questions give rise to certain objections, which can be dealt with with certain answers and the very fact that certain problems relate to each other is itself a discovery, right? So you might think about causation and ethics and think they have nothing to do with each other, right? Causation is metaphysics, ethics is about what we should do. But then when you see that a certain conception of causation would imply determinism and that you might think that determinism rules out free will and that free will is required for ethics, you discover, oh, now that I actually understand all that, 
I see that um, if I take a certain view on causation, I might wind, wind up being a moral skeptic, right? Or imagine that I, I'm a theist, so I want to say that God exists, and then I have to deal with the problem of evil, and then I might like come up with some theory about possibility in order to make it the case that God couldn't prevent evil from occurring, right? So the, the, these um, relationships between uh, maybe very technical ideas in modal logic, which deals with possibility and necessity, and the assertion that God exists, which you would never have thought of if you didn't do philosophy. And I want to say that that's all genuine discovery, like in mathematics. So what I'm discovering there is genuine interrelations between ideas. And there, I'm finding something out. I know something I didn't know before. So that was my first claim, um, that philosophy is the history of philosophy. Before I move on to the next one, I want to admit that I've been sort of very casually skating over a big question, which is, I keep talking about philosophical questions, answers to all this range of questions, and I haven't given you any way of demarcating what counts as philosophical questions, right? So, uh, you know, it seems pretty clear that some questions are philosophical, like, do we have free will? And some are not, like, should we have pasta tonight for dinner? Maybe should we? Maybe that's not true. Maybe all questions considered with sufficient rigor and care and so on become philosophical questions. But I'm not really inclined to think that, right? And, and in fact, I also don't think is it true that one plus one equals two is a philosophical question. I mean, there are questions you get philosophical questions you can ask about the fact that one plus one equals two, but it's not itself a philosophical question. Um, or you know, is Peter wearing a a black shirt or a blue shirt, not a philosophical question. So I think we have a kind of we have a kind of sense of some obvious, obviously philosophical questions, some obviously non-philosophical questions. And you might think that um, that's sort of enough. Like there's a kind of a core of obvious philosophical questions, and then some other questions that aren't philosophical. In the middle, there's some sort of hard cases where you're not sure whether to call it philosophical or not. And I think that that actually, there's something to be said for that, but there is another possibility, which is to say, instead, instead of saying that there's like some paradigm philosophical questions and then other questions count as philosophical if they remind us of those questions or if they're sort of adjacent to those questions, we might say, well, no, actually philosophy is more historically contingent than that. And philosophy just counts as whatever is philosophical in a given time and place. So for example, in antiquity, it counted as a philosophical question to ask why fire, which is one of the four elements, rises to its natural place, which is above air, right? Well, actually the premise of the question is false. So no philosopher would ask that question anymore because we know that fire is not an element. Right? So that was like a core issue in natural philosophy and antiquity in the Middle Ages, and now it's just gone. It's not in philosophy any anymore at all. So you might think, well, what counts as a, even a core philosophical question could change. Again, um, I think that nowadays people would probably be quite ready to admit or even insist that certain questions in philosophy of race or feminist philosophy are core philosophical questions, like obviously philosophical questions. For example, the question, what is race? But no one was thinking about that in the 11th century or the fourth century BC. So what counts even as obviously philosophical changes from one time to another. I think though that it, there's a problem with saying, well, philosophy in any given time and place is just what, philosoph what is called philosophy. And there's an obvious problem which is that not all cultures and times even have the word philosophy or the concept. And a great example here, which we could talk about more in the Q&A if you like, is ancient Indian philosophy. So ancient Indian philosophy, I submit, is obviously philosophical. So they argue about things like the sources of knowledge and uh, whether bodies are composed of atoms or not. And, uh, you know, the nature of metaphysics, monism versus non-monism, ethics, like Buddhist ethics, um, whether we have a self or not, 
and goes on and on and on, right? So basically every kind of philosophy that you can think of was done in ancient India, but they did not have the word philosophy because they weren't um, sufficiently influenced by Greek culture, if they were influenced at all, to have the word, right? In contrast with the Islamic world, which did have the word philosophy. So they have the word falsafa, which is based on the Greek word philosophy. And I think it's just obviously not a possible view <laughs> that you would say, well, whatever these Indian thinkers were doing, it wasn't philosophy because they didn't have the word philosophy. I would say rather, it goes, it's the other way around. They did, they did have philosophy, but they didn't have the word philosophy. So I think that's a problem with this kind of historically contextualized conception of what philosophy is. But actually there's problems with the other suggestion I, I suggested, um, which is that we have a sense of which things are kind of core philosophical questions and they just stay all the time. Um, because if, if we sort of go with our own intuitions about what counts as a philosophical question, then we wind up sort of like um, time traveling imperialists. We say, well, we don't care Aristotle, what you think counts as a philosophical question. Like your question about fire, that's a wrong example of a philosophical question. You weren't even doing philosophy when you thought you were doing natural philosophy because we now know that that's not a philosophical question. That seems wrong too. So I think this is actually a very difficult issue. Um, this issue of which questions count as philosophical. And to be honest, I don't really have an answer to this, um, except a kind of pragmatic one, which is that if you can get an audience to believe you're talking about philosophy, then that's good enough for current purposes. <laughs> that's obviously not a good answer, but it tends to be what I do. So when I produce the podcast, for example, I kind of just go on, you know, what do I think my audience would think counts as philosophy? And what can I push them to accept would be philosophically interesting if they haven't thought about it before? That's obviously not a good answer, but maybe there is no good answer. So I'm not actually, I'm not sure if there's any reason to think that there's a fact in the world about what is philosophy and what isn't. Because it's a human practice, it evolves over time, right? So it's sort of like, what is art? Well, you know, you can kind of think about it if you want, but it's not obvious that there's an answer to the question. Okay, so now finally I come to my second claim out of five, you'll be glad to know that the, the other claims will go by faster. Um, now, this is kind of implied by what I said already, but I think it's very important to my view. Contemporary philosophy doesn't really have any privileged status. So it's a way, it's a, it's a part of the exploration of this map of philosophical questions and answers, but is really just the latest part, the part that's being filled in right now or very recently, right? And just as contemporary art is no more or less art than art that was done in the 14th century, so contemporary philosophy is no more or less philosophy than philosophy that was, that was done in the 14th century. It differs from other kinds of philosophy, mostly by proceeding from certain assumptions and intuitions and by focusing on certain issues and not others. So like I said before, Contemporary philosophy or philosophers no longer think about what would individuate angels if there are any, um, and they don't think about, um, you know, Aristotelian physics. They do think a lot about things like grounding. So gro everyone talks about grounding these days. I don't know why. It's become very fashionable. Um, that was, so that would be an example of, uh, of uh, something that philosophers think about a lot. They think a lot about the relationship between the mind and the brain which is something that people have been thinking about in many other cultures, but not all of them. Um, they, there's a great focus on certain questions and certain approaches to those questions. And uh, I guess a lot of contemporary philosophers say, yeah, because these are the right questions to ask and these are the right approaches to these questions. And that there might be something to be said for that, but I would point out that actually contemporary philosophers don't, aren't really in a very good position to judge that, right? Especially if they haven't considered the other options. What are the other options? Well, the whole rest of philosophy. In other words, the whole rest of the history of philosophy. So this would sort of be like looking at the map and filling in only one little corner and thinking you were exploring the whole map. So it's certainly true that there's a part of the map which is being explored to an unprecedented degree of in terms of the effort that's being put into it, the detail with which is being done, the money behind it, 
and so on, because there is probably one analytic philosopher alive now for every pre 19th century philosopher <laughs> that ever existed. There's just so many philosophers now publishing so much about the predilections of contemporary philosophy. And by the way, it's not just analytic philosophy too. It's also, you know, continental philosophy, if you still want to use that phrase, um, is still a going concern. Uh, but I don't think any of that, at least it doesn't obviously have any sp special status relative to the rest of the philosophy, except insofar as it's just been um, subjected to an immense amount of brilliant analysis by really smart professional philosophers. So our map doesn't look like the, the, the map I showed you before. It looks more like this. So we're like, this is what's being done now. And they've sort of gone over here, but they have no idea about all this stuff. And all this stuff is the stuff contemporary philosophers don't bother knowing about. And notice that it follows from what I've said that the blank spaces on their map, they might think, well, who cares? Because none of that's interesting. And I want to say, well, they should care because that's part of philosophy. Why? Because philosophy is the history of philosophy. And they're only doing this little part. They're not doing the rest. Actually, I should have found a map where there's almost nothing filled in, but this was the best I could do. So they're really in this tiny little corner over here, right? Third claim. You might think, well, hang on a second. The fact that all these contemporary philosophers agree about what presuppositions to proceed from, what counts as intuitive and what doesn't, and agree about which questions to ask, that should encourage us to think that they've got it right and that they're giving the right answers to the right questions. And although I, that might be an appealing thought, I, I guess there are some reasons to be skeptical about it. For example, the, the more consensus you have, the less likely you are to explore other options, right? So at the moment, there are very powerful financial and institutional incentives against contemporary philosophers exploring areas of philosophy that aren't of interest to other contemporary philosophers, right? They can't get published in journals, they can't get jobs, et cetera. And this is something people talk about a lot, that this is a problem, so that the, the kind of professionalization of philosophy actually inhibits philosophical creativity. I actually don't think that's really true. So it actually encourages philosophical creativity as long as you're staying in the right part of the map. But you're not going to go off and explore New Zealand if everyone else is focusing on exploring New York, right? That's my thought. And furthermore, history gives us a kind of warning about this, which is that this is not the first period in the history of philosophy where there was a lot of consensus. There was, if anything, even more consensus about how to do philosophy and what the interesting issues of philosophy were in, let's say, 13th century Paris. So there you have lots and lots of philosophers doing philosophy in a very constrained style on certain very key issues, like, say, the problem of universals. Um, and, you know, they didn't agree about a lot of things. There were bitter disputes, but they, they kind of had consensus about what what philosophy was and what it was worth doing and how it would look. Um, and of course, that consensus has been replaced with a completely different consensus, right? If you can't pick up a contemporary philosopher, put them down in 13th century Latin, uh, Paris, teach them fluent Latin, and they would be completely at home, right? All their presuppositions, intuitions, and many of their interests would be different. So the mere fact that we have consensus about what kind of philosophy is worth doing is not a good reason to think that we live in some this time and place, which by incredible luck is unique in being the only time in the history of humanity and the only culture on, in the world where philosophy is being done correctly. And it, it wouldn't, of course, be arrogant and ridiculous for us to say that. It would be arrogant and ridiculous for anyone to say that in any time and place. So if that's what the 13th century Parisians thought, they were just as much wrong as we would be thinking it. But we have a better sense of the history of philosophy than they do, so we have less excuse. Furthermore, let's even suppose that it's true that this is the only time in culture where philosophy is being done right. How would we know that? Well, probably we would need to look at the other options, right? We don't even know what the other options were. How could we know that they were wrongheaded? We don't even know what they were saying, right? 
So who would be in a position to judge, to compare the way philosophy is being done now and here to the way it's been done in other places and times? Well, of course, it's the historian of philosophy, which is why the historian of philosophy is the best philosopher. In fact, I might almost say the historian of philosophy is the only one who's attempting, even attempting to do what philosophy is, namely to understand as full as possible a range of answers to philosophical questions. And this is, I think, um, in line with something that other people have said to justify doing the history of philosophy, that actually the fact that other times and places have offered philosophy that looks different from ours is not a problem or a drawback or something we need to, to apologize for. It's actually the advantage. History of philosophy allows us to escape the current philosophical consensus and see it from the outside, see what the other options would be. So as Peter Deitch said, the usefulness of history of historical knowledge and philosophy is that the prejudices of our own period may lose their grip on us if we imagine until we enter into another period when people's prejudices were different. So I think that's right. So that it, the more you know about the whole history of philosophy, the more you understand what all the options are to all of the questions that have ever been considered philosophical. And you know what all of the objections and problems and interconnections are between those solutions and other solutions. Um, now, notice that I don't want to say that the historian of philosophy should therefore ignore contemporary philosophy. Remember, I said contemporary philosophy is just as much a part of the history of philosophy as any other part. And there, of course, might be pragmatic reasons of all kinds to even spend more of your time worrying about contemporary philosophy than, say, 14th century Japanese philosophy, right? <laughs> because you want to be able to talk to your colleagues, for example. So, I mean, I've always really, I mean, I love contemporary philosophy and I've always enjoyed talking to colleagues who specialize in it, as long as they don't tell me it's a waste of time to do history of philosophy. Because contemporary philosophy is just as much a part of philosophy as any other kind of philosophy. And it's an interesting part, you know, so just kind of like all the other parts are interesting. Um, so the ultimate philosopher would not be the philosopher who's doing contemporary philosophy and who's the best at it. It would be the philosopher who knows everything there is to know about the history of philosophy, including the contemporary part. That would be the perfect philosopher. But of course, this is not possible because there's too much to know. So you have, I mean, just for starters, you couldn't possibly know even half of what there is to know about contemporary philosophy, never mind history of philosophy. And as someone who's been spending their whole life, and especially the last 10 years, trying to get their heads around the whole history of philosophy, I can tell you that I haven't even come close. And I've been trying quite hard. Probably other people could do better than me um, because I'm spending so much of my time trying to come up with giraffe jokes at the same time. But, you know, this is not possible, right? You cannot know about the whole history of philosophy. You'd have to live for many hundreds of years. And even if you did, you'd have the problem that your contemporaries would be spending those hundreds of years producing more philosophy, which is give you more to learn about. So it's not possible. Um, but I still think that the it's kind of ideal to shoot for. So the ideal to shoot for would be someone who's completely open to learning about all philosophy in all times and places. Now, um, even if we imagined an ideal philosopher, like the perfect philosopher in 2021, Remember that the map is always getting more filled out, so it's expanding. And this brings me to my last and final claim, uh, which is the last slide of the talk. Since philosophy is expanding all the time by exploring more of these connections, proposing new questions that count as philosophical, proposing new answers to new questions or old questions, discovering objections to certain positions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that means that more of the domain is being explored. The map's getting filled out all the time. So there's always more to know. And like I said before, I think this is actually discovery. It's not mere invention, so to speak. So when we discover that certain answers to certain questions involves, let's sort of bring upon them certain counter, counter arguments, which could be answered in certain ways, that's all discovery. It's like you're finding out something true about philosophy when you do that. And so philosophy is making progress all the time. So I have a kind of optimistic rather than skeptical view at that level. It's kind of a weird kind of progress because we're not finding out 
the right answers necessarily, but we're finding out all the time more about what would be what there is to be said in favor of certain answers. But I would say this with a, a caveat, which is that if we forget or ignore the rest of the history of philosophy, then we're actually going backwards, right? So insofar as we, for example, completely ignore all the achievements of ancient India in philosophy, we've foreclosed a whole bunch of philosophical options by not even bothering to look at it. And we'd have to prove, we'd have to produce a heck of a lot of contemporary philosophy to make that act of forgetting balanced out by new discoveries. And in fact, it may even be that we're as much as we're producing new philosophy at a furious clip, we may be forgetting old philosophy and philosophy in other times and places even faster. But I hope not. And I hope that this talk has motivated you all to be more interested in the history of philosophy than you already were when I started. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, Peter. This was very interesting. We have several questions, uh, but actually, let me start by saying, you know, we were talking about at the beginning uh, whether what, what would be my take on your on your on your okay. uh, talk. And uh, no, I, I like a lot of what you said. In fact, um, uh, some times ago, I published a paper where I argued that philosophy makes progress to the exploration of what I called um, conceptual landscapes. So I didn't use the map metaphor, but it's it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. uh, and the notion was that what counts as progress is a the discovery of new areas on the map, if to use your map, your your or the invention perhaps even of new uh, you know new questions, new things that you want to talk about, and then the refinement of the ones that are already there. Uh, like for instance, uh, you know, in ethics, uh, utilitarianism was an invention, and then after that, the discussion has been about criticizing uh, certain aspects of utilitarianism and then responding to those criticisms, and that has made conceptual uh, progress. And so, part of the uh, notion, uh, I think, would be that yes, philosophy does make progress. It just doesn't make progress in the same way in which science makes progress. Mm -hmm. And then, in fact, we should kind of stop making that kind of analogy. I think that uh, you mentioned that philosophy is pr progress in philosophy or the way to conceptualize philosophy. It's much more close to mathematics and, and, and logic, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, when you discover new, new things, it's because you're discovering things that are logically entailed by certain positions. You're not discovering facts out there. In other yeah. words, like 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 science does. Um, however, I was going to push back on just one of your examples, which is, uh, so you mentioned Aristotle and uh, you know talking asking asking uh, why is the fire rises above air. Now, you're right that never say never in a sense, but I'm going to make a pretty substantial bet that that question is never going to come back as a valuable question in philosophy, and that that in itself counts as progress. In this particular case, it will not come back because, as you say, the assumption behind that, the empirical assumption, I think, behind that question is no longer tenable. I mean, unless we got physics fundamentally wrong, which I think it's unlikely, then then that's why that question isn't going to come back. But but I think that other questions that might at the moment be uh, eclipsed from the view of contemporary philosophers might very well come back. So what do you think? Is that, does that make sense in terms of thinking in terms of conceptual landscapes? and, and Yeah, uh, so I think what you're saying sounds a lot like what, what I'm claiming. I think that's right. Um, I mean, actually, it's interesting that you latch onto the mathematics analogy. Actually, if I were pushed to keep only one of my two analogies, I think I might go with art rather than mathematics. Mm, yeah. Because although I agree that philosophy involves often involves like logical entailments. And I kept talking about things like counter arguments and, you know, so it sounded very logical and sort of propositional what I was talking about. A lot of it is also, you know, the creativity to even just think of a new question and the sort of conceptual space of um, philosophy is in some ways more like the conceptual space of art than the conceptual space of mathematics, mm -hmm. because it's so, first of all, it's so contested what it even consists in. Right. whereas that's less true of mathematics. And uh, secondly, because um, you have to actually be yeah, creative in even thinking about ways of approaching, like what did you even mean to do philosophy, right? Changes right. so much. Right. And it changes the way that 
um, being an artist has changed, i.e. very much over time. Whereas what it means to be a mathematician has certainly changed, but I think not as much as it, what it means to be an artist. Yeah. Um, just to say something like, about the science yeah. point, mm -hmm. I, I have run these ideas by people before, including here in Munich. And, and the most, I think the most formidable objection to what I'm saying is that the progress of science has done so much to determine what does and doesn't count as plausible or even possible philosophy, that contemporary philosophy actually has a much better claim to be the useful part of philosophy than I've been admitting. So I kind of made it sound like, well, contemporary philosophy is just on a par with fifth century AD philosophy in Alexandria, right? They're both part of philosophy. Yeah. And part, and part of my answer to that would be, well, remember that wrong philosophy is still philosophy. <laughs> Sure. But you know, why would you ultimately? Why would you want to spend your time looking around, looking at wrong philosophy in great detail if you could look at the right philosophy? So my answer to this question would be to um, concede the point when it bears on the parts of philosophy that have kind of been stolen away from philosophy and become science. So something like chemistry, which used to be part of natural philosophy, really is no doesn't actually even count as a philosophical question anymore, right? But I think the questions that still count for us as philosophical questions in, in many cases are explored just as validly and interestingly in very different times and cultures um, as they are now. So, I mean, like clearly there's all this brain science and it can tell you all kinds of things about consciousness and so on. But I, don't, I think it would be very questionable that any of it has rendered completely moot or pointless the consideration of the self and of consciousness that you find in the Upanishads, let's say, to take an incredibly remote thing culturally and temporally. And if a contemporary philosopher of mind says to me, well, I'm sure whatever they say in the Upanishads is completely pointless because I know all about brain science and they didn't, then I would say, well, why don't you go away and spend six months reading and thinking about the Upanishads so that you're actually qualified to judge and then come back and tell me whether you really think it was a complete waste of time. And my suspicion is that they think it was really cool and interesting if they went to it with an open mind. All right, we have several questions and uh, a little bit of time. So let me start with Monique question, which you kind of partially addressed, but it's interesting uh, anyway to sort of get your, uh, your thought about it. What is the boundary between philosophy and religion, as well as between philosophy and science. And that, yeah, that I, is, I assume you'll focus on, and, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Maybe I'll focus on religion because we're yeah. just talking mm -hmm. about science. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting question. So actually um, people in general, I have to say, have been really nice to me about my podcast, which is interesting because there would be so many opportunities to tell me off for doing things wrong. And usually people are very polite and say, well, actually, you know, <laughs> but I think the, the one thing that I get that I would legit, I would actually call something close to a complaint is that I spend too much time talking about religion because for the last, you know, six years or something or more, I've been doing some topics that in some sense count as medieval philosophy. So it took me a long time to do Islamic philosophy took me a long time to do medieval Latin philosophy. Um, and I did Byzantine philosophy which was extremely religious and now I'm doing the Reformation. And even within the Indian context, I spent a lot of time talking about the Upanishads and Vedic tradition and so on. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of religion in my podcast and in the books. Um, and I think a lot of uh, philosophers and even a lot of just people <laughs> have this idea that religion and philosophy are somehow mutually exclusive. And I have to admit that I've always found this very puzzling because in my own research, since I mostly do late ancient and medieval philosophy, I spend all my time working on thinkers who think that philosophy and religion are like this, right? So that they're completely bound up with each other. They have lots of different views on how they're bound with each other. And so for example, some of them would say that there are certain truths that are revealed by God that you couldn't know rationally. Others would deny that, but there are, very few, if any, pre-modern philosophers or thinkers, I should say, who think of philosophy and religion as being antithetical or mutually exclusive. And in fact, I think 
probably most pre-modern philosophers wouldn't understand what that proposal even amounts to. So you're saying that like the things I can figure out with reason are somehow all rendered false or completely invalidated by faith? Why would you think that? And so I was very interested to read recently while I was working on Calvin for the 16th century episodes, while I'm doing the Reformation now, that Calvin pretty much says this. So he says, well, my style of Protestantism, Calvinism, embraces truths of faith that fly in the face of reason and are rejected by anyone who's engaging in rational reflection. So I have decided to call this idea that religion and philosophy uh, are mutually exclusive, the Calvinist position. <laughs> and a lot of modern day atheists are Calvinists in this sense. And what they're doing there is they're falling prey to a kind of echo of a very extreme um, and contentious position on the nature of reason and faith that was taken for the first time in the context of the Protestant Reformation in opposition to the scholastics who thought that religion and reason go hand in hand, right? So just historically, I think it's um, simply wrong to say that philosophy has usually been antithetical to religion. And in fact, I just think of religion as one of many contexts in which philosophical questions arise. So obviously if you're a Byzantine Christian, you'll be very worried about things like the Trinity and how to make that work and proofs of God's existence. If you're an atheist living in 21st century Brooklyn, you won't think that probably, but you know, ultimately um, I don't think that the presence of faith makes rational reflection on philosophical problems any less philosophical, any more, any more for example, than um, the fact that you're writing in a capitalist society, which obviously very much constrains your ability to think of non-capitalist possibilities as even thinkable. Um, if you're living in a capital and are embracing kind of capitalist society, then there are certain issues that will kind of become salient for you and certain avenues that you just won't want to go down. And I think religion is like that. It's just the context, about one of many contexts in which you can do philosophy. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, the next question is by my colleague, Chad Kidd. Um, he says, um, this question of philosophy reminds me, conception of philosophy, sorry, reminds me of Anna Harin's conception of thinking in her book, The Life of the Mind. There she draws on the distinction in Kant between Verstand, often inaptly translated understanding, and Werner's reason. Understanding is a capacity drawn upon in the formation of judgments or the making of claims grounded on reasons. This is the mental structure properly involved in the search for truth. Reason, on the other hand, at least as our hand reads Kant, is not directed at truth, but at the ascertainment of meaning, of placing the world that we know and experience in the context of an absolute or unconditional totality, which makes sense of our lives and our experiences. But the latter task is endless, meaning is not truth, and as such, it cannot simply be established, placed in a book, made part of scientific tradition, built upon it. Rather, meaning must be remade every day. So what do you think about this sort of conception? How does that line up with your ideas here? Wow, that's a really hard question. <laughs> yeah, so, Chad is known for that. <laughs> so I, I would say, I don't think I can do justice to that answer briefly or that question briefly, but I, I guess what I would say is that what I was describing is about truth. So it's, that it, it's various attempts to discover philosophical truth and in fact, I, I actually kind of thought you might say this, Massimo, that, I, that there's something that kind of went missing in my presentation, which is the idea that philosophy is ultimately about how to live, right? So this is how the Stoics, your beloved right. Stoics thought about philosophy and a lot of ancient philosophers thought about philosophy, but not just them, right? So, or not just ancient Greek philosophers, but you know, ancient Indian philosophers, ancient Chinese philosophers. I mean, Confucius, his philosophy is also just about, as much about how to live as the Stoics mm -hmm. was. And we kind of lost that to a large extent, although not fully, right? Because as you know, a lot of people really like your approach to the Stoic stuff. So it still has an appeal. Um, and I, I, I have wondered to what extent my view can accommodate this idea that philosophy is, or at least should include as a very substantial component, something like finding one's place in the world, finding the meaning of things, right? 
-hmm. which might be, as, as the questioner says, might be kind of remade in your very act of living or the way that you live or remade on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I mean, I'm kind of tempted to say, oh, that's an interesting proposal. Let's think about that philosophically, right? So that I would sort of retreat to the question of whether that is true, right? Whether it's true that philosophy has to involve a way of life or that certain ways of life are better than others. But if you think about philosophy as being something more like piety or holiness, like it's just a way of being to live a philosophical life, I wouldn't necessarily deny that. So this kind of, I mean, I think the way I talked about it implied a lot of ironic detachment, like, oh, I just want to know what all the possibilities are and survey them. But ultimately, I just kind of want to know what the possibilities are. I, I guess I do think that that's what philosophy is, but that there's a certain kind of philosopher who might sort of inhabit part of that map with more passion and commitments than I sort of seem able to do. And I don't want to disparage that, but I'm not sure that I think it's really um, constitutive of what philosophy has to be, if that makes sense. So yeah. Much. One of the questions uh, from one of the, the from, from our audience is about, it kind of builds further on what you just said. And it's about, the, you know, you, you were mentioning that sometimes like in the Indian traditions, certain traditions just don't even have the word philosophy. That doesn't mean they're not doing philosophy or what we would recognize as philosophy. Mm -hmm. However, um, the question points out that maybe a lot of traditions, maybe all traditions have something, if not the word, certainly the concept of wisdom. And so what is the relationship between philosophy and wisdom? Yeah, so I think wisdom might be uh the well if you if i think maybe we should first of all recognize that the word wisdom so as aristotle would say is said in many ways and it might be quite a bit broader right so you might um, you, you know my grandmother is so wise she always gives me good advice right <laughs> so that normally it wouldn't mean that you're crediting your grandmother with being a philosopher <laughs> but if you think about yeah this, so there's all these words like um hikma in arabic and sophia and in, uh, in Greek, which is actually, of course, the root of the word philosophy, um, then you might think that wisdom is the outcome of philosophy, of doing, being good at philosophy or having, having done philosophical reflection. And then I guess I would be tempted to say, why would you think the part where you vote is wisdom? Wouldn't wisdom consist in understanding the options and what there is to be said for all of them? So actually, if anything, I think my pre presentation of what philosophy is goes very well with the idea that philosophy is wisdom or is the pursuit of wisdom because it's the pursuit of a deep, complex understanding of a terrain. So it's more like knowing your way around than it is like making an appointment for where to have dinner. All right. All right. The next question is by Logan. I'm going to take two or three more and then we'll wrap it, wrap it up. So Peter, can you please talk about collectivism and individualism and the ways in which different cultures have informed philosophical views? Okay, yeah. So here I, I'd like to bring in something that I didn't say very much about, which is African philosophy. Um, so this is really interesting because, and in fact, I think one of the most interesting things about looking at pre-modern uh, African philosophy, or not even pre-modern, but philosophy in traditional African societies, let's say, which of course still exist, um, is that if you, if you really look into that, as I did together with Chike for our podcast, you really find that it challenges your ideas about what philosophy could be and it opens them up. So for example, um, it requires you to take seriously the thought that philosophy might not always come in written form. It might come in the form of like sayings or stories or just oral tradition more generally. Also, we tend to think of philosophy as something that's done by specific philosophers whose names we probably know. And even if, and if, even if we don't know, it's only accidental that we don't know, like this manuscript from the medieval period is anonymous, right? But the person had a name, it's an individual. Whereas in African, um, in, the, in research into traditional African philosophy, you, usually, although not always, the idea is to impute certain philosophical views to entire groups of people. 
And that actually goes, as it happens, goes together with something that people often say about traditional African societies, which is that they are communalist. So they had ways of, had and have ways of making decisions that involve like coming to consensus rather than one person imposing their will on other people, as you might think is common of pre-modern European cultures. Um, and a, a radical version of this would be that in African philosophy, somehow the self is sort of diffused within the community, right? So that I am, there's this um, saying, I am because we are, right? So this Ubuntu idea that um, Desmond Tutu has talked about. Um, so that, that this would shape African philosophy and give it a fundamentally different character than individualist Western, i.e. European origin philosophy. And people sometimes say similar things about Chinese philosophy, right? Or Asian culture is supposed to be communalist. I, I wouldn't want to go so far as to pass judgment on that. Um, but I think actually the this is all sort of grist for my mill because if we take this seriously, then it just requires us to take even more seriously the thought that there are ways of doing philosophy and realms of philosophy to explore that are very different from the ones being explored now. In, Anglo, in English language philosophy for the most part. So you don't, I mean, if you think that what the Yoruba thought in 17th century, in the 17th century counts as philosophy, at least in part, then you're coming to grips there with a very different worldview than what would be inhabited by your average modern day English speaking philosopher, right? And so all the more reason to think that um, it's worth exploring, right? gives you very different options. And I think communalism in a sense is just one of those options. Like the idea that philosophy could be done by a group instead of a person, the idea that um, the self or that identity could be communal. These are things worth exploring and thinking about African philosophy would help you explore those ideas and options more than thinking about most kind of contemporary philosophy would. Yeah. Uh, Scott brings up an interesting uh topic, which is that of the use of intuitions in philosophy, which has been mm -hmm. controversial. There's been research over the last few years, even in uh, so-called experimental philosophy, which no, it's not an oxymoron, um, <laughs> that about the limitations or role of intuitions in philosophy. What, what's your take on, on intuitions? Um, so I think philosophical actually, so I think that um, people sometimes talk about this as if it were like a really distinctive feature of modern day philosophy. And I think to some extent it is. So like this, this move that you often see in contemporary philosophy departments where the person giving a talk will get up and say, well, we all have an intuition that such and such is the case. And yet, problem. So I'm going to save our intuition or clarify our intuition or um, refine it or somehow show that it's true. But what the philosopher is very unlikely to say is, well, who cares what we find intuitive? Mm -hmm. And actually, um, that issue, that question of whether intuitions have any kind of standing in philosophy is itself a very long contested question. So it's not true that only contemporary analytic philosophers take intuition seriously. I think Aristotle took them seriously. But some philosophers are radically revisionary of intuitions, like Neoplatonists. If they're told, well, the common person on the street finds such and such intuitive, that would probably be for them a reason to think that such and such is more likely to be false because common people are not in touch with the intelligible realm. And so whatever they think is like immediately under suspicion <laughs> rather than being, so it's, it's more likely to be under suspicion than be used as a kind of starting point for a philosophy. And it's certainly not going to be some kind of constraint which you're not, not allowed to offend, right? So mm -hmm. the idea that, in, that as soon as you say something that's too counterintuitive, you have to go back and start over is something that um, I think some historical philosophers have accepted and some have rejected. And so actually, the, I, th I think it would be wrong to say that there's um, some general rule about the role of intuitions in philosophy. Rather, this itself is part of the map. This might be one of these meta questions that I talked about with the 3D map. So what mm -hmm. role or standing should intuitions be given relative to our practice of philosophy is itself a philosophical question. Right. 
So let me ask you one more question, and that is, uh, where is your map going at this point? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I kind of have, so I sort of have my day job and my hobby, and my day job is to work on um, late ancient philosophy and philosophy in the Islamic world. And so I do in that context, I do work that is sometimes aimed at a broader audience, but is also supposed to speak to other specialists. So for example, something I've been working on a lot recently uh, because I'm running this big research project on it is uh, philosophy of animals in the Islamic world. So what did they think about whether animals can think and how we should treat them and so on, right? And that's super interesting. And I think it is actually a broader interest in a way that maybe some of the stuff I've done on philosophy in the Islamic world isn't of such broader interest. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing in my research. Uh, and by the way, I should say that it has had an impact on my way of life to do that. So it, mm. like I became a vegetarian after thinking about this a lot yeah. or a pescatarian at least, but I should be a vegetarian, not a pescatarian. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so, so that's kind of one aspect of what I'm doing. And then in the podcast, I, um, I'm sort of, always just doing whatever is next chronologically and culturally. So I'm simultaneously doing 20th century Africana philosophy with Chike and looking forward to doing Chinese philosophy with Karen Lai. And um, in the sort of original series where I'm covering European philosophy and its offshoots, I'm doing Reformation philosophy and kind of warming up for the 17th century. So actually, I mean, as I said, I'm, I'm super, super far away from being this ideal figure I described before, who knows everything there is to know about both contemporary and the history of philosophy. And I don't think it's possible to even know a large part of that. But I, I mean, one thing I, I like about the, the sort of various, um, the various tasks I've inflicted on myself is that it's at, least, it's at least requiring me to look at lots of different kinds of philosophy from different times and places at the same time. Because on a, in any given week or at least month, I would certainly be doing some work on 20th century African, African and Africana philosophy, some work on 16th century Reformation philosophy, and some work on Greek philosophy, and some work on philosophy in the Islamic world. So that gives me nice. like, a lot <laughs> yeah. to do. That's, that's quite a bit. All right. Thanks very much, Peter. This, this was very enlightening. It was very interesting. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. For... Thanks so much for coming, everybody. Thanks for the questions. All right. And uh, before we go, I'm just going to make a couple of announcements. First of all, the video, the slightly edited video of Peter's talk and the discussion will be posted on the philosophy department at City College uh, YouTube site. And uh, for those of you who have uh, come here through Meetup, it will be posted there as well, so you can find it. And I can um, announce that I'll see you on Thursday, 17 November 2022. And our speaker for next year's Philosophy Day will be Jenan Ismail, who is a professor in the Department of Philosophy at Columbia University. Among other things, she's interested in so-called scientific metaphysics, and we'll see what that is all about. <laughs> Other than that, stay safe and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye.